Good morning. We do welcome you this morning to Tabernacle Baptist Church. We are glad on this Lord's Day you've gathered with God's people. What a privilege it is that we can come together in His name. I want to say a special welcome to guests who are with us. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we've been having guests every, every week, and uh, so we're always grateful for those who want to visit with us. Uh, at the end of the service, I'll be down front. Would love an opportunity to meet you if I haven't been able to do so yet. Also, we have information about the church we'd put into your hands. Uh, we've got a welcome center in the vestibule and the lobby of the Family Life Center, so we'd love to get that to you as well. A couple of items to mention to you before we turn our attention to worship. One to the men would remind you about the men's retreat at the Cove coming up March 19th through the 21st, so you'll see it. And the bulletin on the back is a, uh, a bit of information about that. Uh, the cost for that is $325. Uh, we, we need that by February 24th, but really if you could let us know as soon as you can uh, if, uh, if you would be able to go on that trip. So I would encourage you to be a part of that. Also want to let you know that uh, I have called for a day of prayer and fasting for our church. Uh, we'll be doing that on Wednesday, February the 3rd. Wednesday, February the 3rd, you'll, there'll be some materials made available to you. More information will be coming. So that's on a Wednesday, uh, and uh, I'll encourage you to fast. I'll encourage you then also to be praying for yourself, for the church, for the nation, uh, and, uh, and just giving some dedicated time. Then that night, that Wednesday night, during our prayer meeting time, we'll have a time of focused corporate prayer as well. So uh, just go ahead and put that uh, on, on your calendar, February the 3rd, Wednesday, February the 3rd. Well, again, our privilege is that we can worship our God today. So I invite you as you join hearts and minds together and lift your voices to the praise of our great God. Amen. Good morning. Psalm 99 says, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footstool, holy is he. He alone is holy, he alone is worthy of our praise and adoration. Let's stand together this morning as we sing. to him, the God of life, who formed the mountains by his might. All praise to him who names the stars that sing his fame in skies afar. All praise to him who reigns in love, who guides the galaxies above, that bends to be To him whose love is seen in Christ the Son, the servant King, who left behind his glorious throne to lay the ransom for his own. Oh, praise to him who humbly came to bear our sorrows in and shame, who lived to die. Sacrifice. 
of all truth and peace, the fount of joy and holiness. O oh, Father, Son, and Spirit, now our souls we live, our wills we love, to you the triune.
cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Amen. Let's be seated. This morning as we pray together, we will be doing so in light of Psalm 27. Uh, So if you would like to follow along with me as I pray us through uh, this psalm this morning, it is a psalm that at, at, at both times one declares confidence in God's goodness toward us and at the same time uh, recognizing the the challenges of others, uh, the world around us, and the circumstances we might face. And so uh, I felt this, this is a good way for us to pray this morning. So Psalm 27, I invite you to bow with me as we pray. Glorious God, we bow before you, our Lord, who is our light and our salvation. And because you are a God of great power and glory and truth, whom shall we fear? We thank you, God, that you are the strength of our life, and so there is no reason for us to be afraid, though the circumstances of life, the culture in which we live that, that, that seems opposed to the things of God can indeed bring anxiety and concern. Father, we will not be afraid. Though the forces that are aligned against your will and your kingdom may be many, we we shall not fear. We will rest in confident faith. And so, Father, as, as we face the trials and tribulations of life, as we face the challenges of those from without, we also come seeking your manifest presence. Our desire is that you, Lord, would, would be the one who is heart and center of our lives. God, it is, it is you we desire to, to dwell in your midst. May, may we dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives. May we behold then the beauty of the Lord. God is a New Testament people. We are grateful that you have now formed and fashioned us as your temple. And so, Father, may we come together as your people, even in the time of trouble. God, that you would hide us in your pavilion, that, that, that in the secret place of your tabernacle we will be hidden, and may we be set up on a high rock. God, be the lifter of our heads so that we are given a vision and sight that rises above the challenges and the challengers that we might face, that we might see you and your face and might know your will and your provision. God, that we would be satisfied with you and you alone. God, we are grateful that as new covenant people, those who have trusted in Christ, We are grateful, God, that that your face is not hidden from us. We are grateful, God, that your anger and wrath has been satisfied in Christ. We thank you, God, that you are our help, that you will neither leave us nor forsake us. God, we glorify you, God of our salvation. And so, Father, we ask that in these days you would continue to teach us your ways and God, may, may our path be smooth. May you lead us in that path, even as we navigate the challenging circumstances around us. Father, we confess there are times we have been tempted to lose heart, but we believe we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so, Father, it is before you that we wait, we trust in patient confidence and hope. And so, God, may we be a people of good courage. God, that you would strengthen our hearts. And may we indeed wait and hope on you, our rock, our light, 
and our salvation. And these things we pray, not in our name and power, but in the name and power of our crucified and risen Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. John, thank you, worship leaders, leading us before the throne. What, what profound, theologically gospel-centered 
uh, rich songs we've sung this morning. Thank you for drawing our attention to God's sovereign grace and glorious work in Christ. If you would take your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah 40. And as you do that, today is the third Sunday of the month, so it is Children's Church. And so children, sixth grade, is that still right? All right. So those up to sixth grade, you are at this time dismissed. If you are older than sixth grade, even if you are not smarter than a sixth grader, you cannot leave, all right? As much as you want to. I think there's more coming from somewhere else. Uh, either that or you people over there, uh, the balcony is about to collapse. All right. Here they come. Should be playing chariots of fire or something, right, as they come. Is that, is that enough, Jane? All right. Okay. All right. So Isaiah 40, this morning, we'll be focusing our attention on the last part of this chapter. We've been in Isaiah 40 since before Christmas and looking at those first 11 verses that, uh, that very much speak to Christmas and yet at the same time the second coming. So we walked our way through that. Then it, after Christmas and up till now, we've been in verses 12 and beyond. Now we come to the passage, it's probably the most well known to us. Uh, and one verse in particular I think will feel the most familiar of, of, of all of them. But this, this is the passage uh, that, that I think we'll recognize. Isaiah is going to bring us to, to a natural conclusion for this chapter. And in, you know, in good preacher fashion, it's a, it, it, it's, it's a bit like a point of application. Now he's going to get uh, a little more practical. Not that the rest of it wasn't. Uh, but now he's, he's going give, to give focus to... Here's what you do with all of these grand promises that have been made and, and God's glory and God's power, God's nature, all these things that have, uh, that have been the focus uh, of these words of comfort. Now he's going to bring them directly to bear uh, upon our lives, how we should respond to, to this great God. So beginning in verse 27... Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim passed over by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? Neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Who here would say that one of your favorite things to do is wait? Anyone? Would anybody here say, really, if I could be anywhere, I want to be at the DMV, right? If, if I could just do anything, what I want to do is spend two hours there. Who, who here says my favorite place on Saturday afternoon is Walmart? Because I just love waiting in lines. Now, I, I would imagine for most of us, we not, we not only dislike it, but we, you know, we kind of resent all of the waiting that we have to do. You've probably heard some of these statistics before. On average, you're going to spend 32 minutes waiting on the doctor every time you visit the doctor. 
As, as one individual said many years ago, they have a waiting room. You have no other option. That's what you will do there, right? It'll, that's what's going to happen. It's an actual waiting room. It's labeled and everything. Did you know you spend 13 hours a year on hold? Which amounts to 43 days of your life. You spend roughly 38 hours in traffic unless you live in a bigger city. It's more like 50 hours a year in traffic. The following number was an attempt to, to calculate all of the hours human beings spend waiting in a year. And it's 37 billion. That, ru- that runs out to roughly six months of your life is spent doing nothing. I mean, you're kind of doing something, but you know what I mean. I mean, you're kind of waiting for something else. Now, I, I know that you know, producers are well aware of the fact that we do a lot of waiting. And so, what is one of the appeals of products that are made for the consumer frees up our time, right? I mean, this this goes way back. I mean, this was the invention of the microwave, right? The the microwave was was to make things faster, tired of waiting for an hour for stuff, let's get it in 12 minutes, right? You know, however long that would take, but that's only just compounded itself. I mean, we, you know, at at one time, how impressed were we with dial-up internet service? And how impressed were we if we could get online in less than 60 seconds, right? I mean, how impatient have we become with these things? You know, we have have fast food. We have drive-thrus. I mean, we have a pot that they actually have to call an instant pot. I mean, it's a pressure cooker, but they change the name, right, and call it an instant pot so that the rest of us will think something magical has happened, right, that your grandmother didn't ever have, but she did, except it blew up and left the beans on the ceiling. So, you know, you've got, all, you've got this. You've got, you've got all these things. And in fact, now, I mean, even what is, what is the most waiting place on the earth? It's not the happiest place, right? It's the most waitingest place. Now, it's not a word, but even at Disney, you can get fast passes, right? To, to get ahead of all of the rabble out there, right? And you can get first in line to be able to go. I mean, undoubtedly, we hate to wait. We recognize that this is a part of life. There are ways in which we're going to have to wait. And so, when we get to Isaiah 40... 27 through 31, especially verse 31, on the one hand, this is a passage of Scripture that has encouraged and and exhorted in many ways the hearts of thousands upon thousands of God's people for centuries, right? But yet at the same time, we read a verse like verse 31 and, and given what I just said, that there can be maybe just a little bit of, oh, a little bit of theological, exegetical kind of tension in the passage, right? Because we know we spent a lot of time waiting, and now, all of a sudden, I'm told, now i got to wait on God. Boy, I'd sure love something to happen faster than it does now. Yeah, this presents us with a challenge and and really even a larger question. So what what, what do we do? What do we do with a passage like this? How do we understand this encouragement to us? Because that is what I think verses 27 through 31 are intended to be. These these are encouraging words to us. How, How do we understand them? Why is this an appropriate conclusion to this entire chapter? Because, because it is. I mean, it's the, it's the ideal way. I mean, obviously, it's the Bible, so whatever it does is, is, is right. But, but this obviously is the ideal way, then, to bring all of this to its natural conclusion. The prophet now driving home the key principal points that he's been making, bringing all of this rich and deep theology directly to bear on our lives. What does it mean, then, to wait upon the Lord? So, keeping in mind what has been our focus throughout Isaiah 40... Isaiah 40 is fundamentally one message, 
comfort, comfort my people, O Israel. Speak tender, comforting words to her. And, and it's, it's a message designed for people that don't even exist yet. This is a prophetic word. Isaiah is speaking to people who will be in exile in Babylon, though we're 200 years away from that moment. But these are words that, that ideally would then be brought back to minds and hearts as they're struggling under, really, the consequences of their own sin, being taken into captivity by Babylon. Has God forgotten us? No, He has not. Has God forgotten all of His promises? No, He has not. And so these words come back as great words of encouragement, comforting words, comforted by God's promises, comforted by God's glory, comforted by, by God's own presence. He'll shepherd His own people and, and, and then we started looking, beginning in verse 12 to, to, to the end, two more categories of comfort that come to us from, from Isaiah chapter 40. And so for three weeks, we, we, we looked at verses 12 through 26. We are comforted by God's nature. Isaiah takes us into a deep dive into the nature of God and His, his immensity and power and transcendence. In fact, he says God's so big and so great, he holds the oceans in the palm of his hand, he can actually balance out the earth between the dust on the earth and the mountains, right? He can make everything in balance. God not only created the stars, he commands the stars, and he knows every one of the 70 billion trillion stars out there by name. And so, you're, it's utterly foolish to think there is any material of any value on this planet that could possibly craft an image of God. In fact, take the, the prettiest thing you can imagine and the, the, the greatest uh, craftsman to create, and it's just trash compared to who God really is. And this, this is what he takes us through, uh, outlining for us the nature of God. Well, this morning we look at our final source of comfort. We're going to have to work our way through it to, to see, you know, how, how, how this is brought to bear on our lives. But, but he concludes here with a word of comfort. We are comforted then by God's provision. So, blanks are on the back of your outline, of the bullets and you received coming in. If you'd like to fill those in, feel free to do so. You know, the prophet's primary point here at the end of chapter 40, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. As, as God's people, we can patiently wait on and trust in God to provide what we need when we need it. That, that's the bottom line. We can be assured, no matter what our emotions may tell us, no matter how we may feel about things, no matter how run down we may feel about things, no matter how heavy the burden it may feel that is on our shoulders and that, that weighs on our hearts, we can be certain God supplies sufficient resources to sufficiently manage the circumstances of life. God comforts us with this promise of provision. So th this is going to be our, our focus. Now here's how he does this. Isaiah does something he's already done in this chapter. He's going to ask some questions that aren't really questions. And he's going to draw our attention to God's nature. He's, he's going to once again speak about who God is. So we're going to take a look at what are three realities about God that give us confidence God's able to provide. So again, these are going to be more blanks that you can fill in. Three realities about God they give us confidence He can indeed provide for us. Number one, letter A, the first reality is His knowledge. The knowledge of God. And by the knowledge of God, I'm not necessarily talking about like God's omniscience, though that will be included. The knowledge of God speaking more personally. And that is, God is not only aware of your circumstances, deeply and specifically to a detail you don't even know about your circumstances is aware of your circumstances. Now, notice how he begins. He begins in verse 27, again, by asking a question of the, the people of God in exile. 
And there is a bit of debate about this verse. Is verse 27 reflecting a complaint that Israel is bringing before God? Or is it more like a lament? In other words, are they fussing at God? Or are they just describing the circumstances and crying out about it? Notice what he says. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? And some translations even use the phrase, why do you complain? My way is hidden from the Lord. My just claim. My, my, my right, uh, the, the actual injustice that has occurred against me, why, why, does, why do you seem to disregard what, what is a righteous dispute we're making? Why, why do we seem hidden from you, God? In, in other words, the, the concern that's being voiced by Judah Keep in mind, he's talking about people who don't yet exist, but indeed, they, they will think this way. Has God forgotten us? Are we now, are we now here in Babylon, and this is, this is where we are? Is this a done deal? Has, has God signed off on his people? Did they finally push the envelope too far? Was it indeed the last straw And now do they find themselves under the thumb of Nebuchadnezzar? And is this where they're going to be forever? In spite of the fact that now, you know, God has judged them for their sin, and and perhaps they are seeking to be realigned and brought back into fellowship with Him. God, why, why does my way seem hidden from you? And, and, And I think I've got a righteous claim here. You made promises in the Old Testament made promises to your people? Why does it seem like you're disregarding it? Why why, why does it it feel like this isn't, like like you're you're not paying attention to me? And it's important to keep in mind, you know, when when the prophet uses this language, when people would use the language, you know, of being hidden from God, this shouldn't be understood to mean that God literally doesn't know where you are, right? I, I, I'd like to think that we all know this intuitively, theologically, you know, but, there, but there's no sense of this passage you know, where this is actually saying that at some point uh, when God gets done working you know, over here in this part and looks back and suddenly realizes, oh, there's people in New Bern that need my help too. My bad. I just over, you fell through the cracks, all right? That, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen. When it says, my way is hidden, you know, I've been disregarded, it's not a way of saying that God literally is unaware. Instead, the complaint is, God, are you giving your manifest attention to my circumstances? Are you attending to the trials and tribulations that I'm facing? It's almost as if the, the, the people were saying, God, it's as if you don't even know where I am or what I'm going through. I doubt anybody in this room has ever asked that question of God, right? We're all super spiritual people that have perfect faith all the time. But for other Christians, they've probably asked this before, right? Oh, wait, maybe you have too? I mean, where, where, where our theology can kind of clash with our own emotions, and, and we know that, yes, God is aware, and God knows, and God's here, yes, 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 we understand all of that, yet at the same time, it doesn't feel like God is doing what He should be doing at the time when I want Him to do it, so it's as if my way is just hidden from God. I guess God just doesn't care. My guess is there's mo- most people in this room would at least give some kind of testimony to feeling some of that on some level. And maybe you immediately feel bad about it afterwards, but nonetheless, having some kind of complaint or lament like this. God, aren't, aren't, you, aren't you aware? Now, here's though what's important about the way the verse is written. This is the statement that they're making, but Isaiah is saying... Stop it. 
don't think this way. When he says he, he doesn't really want to have a, question, uh, a conversation, all right, remember how we said this is the nature of these, uh, these questions? Isaiah is not asking them because he wants to get into a back and forth. Uh, he doesn't care what the reader thinks, all right? Uh, you know, and, and we, we know that, you know, God, God's not actually wanting to engage with us uh, in theological debate. God's not impressed with our thoughts and our insights and our brilliance, all right? So, so when he says, you know, why do you say this? He's not saying, so, te- so tell me, tell me why are you saying this? This is an accusation. Why would you ever say this? There's no grounds for saying this. This is what he means. There's no grounds for suggesting this. In in other words, to exclaim my way is hidden from God is to say something that's just not true. Now, now I've taken this and I've made this kind of more positive point about it. What is Isaiah drawing our attention to? To God's knowledge. God is well aware of every element of your circumstances. God's not surprised by them. God's not overwhelmed by them. God's not stumped by them. You know, God never gets to his wit's end about anything. Do you ever get to your wit's end about things? So, yeah, I, I woke up today, right? Yeah, yes, yes, I do. God, God never thinks, I, I, just, I, just, I, I don't know what to do now. I guess I'll go find the other God from the other universe somewhere, all right, and see what he's doing with his universe. God, that, that, that is never the nature of how God interacts. God is well aware, and it's important to note the assumption made in the, in the statement Judah is asking is that God's manifest presence is not with us. What Isaiah is challenging is not just the fact that God has like some, to use the term, mental awareness. He is suggesting you miss the point if you think God is not actively present in your life right now. God's knowledge, this is, this is a word of comfort to us. I mean, the one reason why we're certain God can provide what we need when we need it is because, in fact, verse 27 is not true. We may feel it, and this is why our theology should always trump our emotions. We've got to tell ourselves the truth. We might think, we might think and feel verse 27, but it's not right. It's not accurate. God is well aware. His knowledge is perfect, absolute, certain. All right, let's go on to number two. It's not just his knowledge, but then also his ability. Not only does God know and is intimately aware and actively engaged in the realities of our life, but God is fully capable of addressing our circumstances. God is fully capable of ensuring his will comes to pass. He's fully capable of making sure these things turn out as he intends. So, notice how he follows up in verse 28. It's a couple of questions he's already asked before, asked it in verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? If you remember from last week, what does that mean? This is something you do know. This is something you have already heard. (laughs) Again, he's not really asking a question. He's making a statement. And what does he then draw our attention to? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He either faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So isn't it interesting that, that now, now the, the way in which he addresses their faulty understanding of God's awareness is to draw their attention once again, and I would argue in like summation form, to, to what is this language of, of the, the, the God of creation, the Lord of the universe, right? Describing him as the everlasting God. Now, that's a way of describing God's eternity, right? There was never a time when he did not exist. God has always been, and God will always be, but to describe him as everlasting, and this is what I think is so critical, this as everlasting God means God will eternally be God 
to the same degree he's always been God. Does that make any sense? Does that sound weird to say it that way? In other, in other words, God, God's not, and I know we've said this before, you know, God's not better at being God today. It's not like, well, I've got some practice running this whole universe thing over the last, you know, um, you know, however many millennia, uh, and boy, I've really gotten a knack. All right, I got the hang of things now, and so now we're really rolling. God doesn't mature. God doesn't grow. God doesn't get smarter. God doesn't get better. Because He's everlasting. He is exactly the same God to the same degree He was God when before there was anything else but God. Everlasting. Then to describe Him as the Lord, that, I mean, that's speaking of His divine power and sovereignty and ruling authority. And then describe Him as the creator of the ends of the earth. Not just the earth, the ends of the earth. Keeping in mind, all that, this, this has been... Uh, a central concern for Isaiah to draw out our understanding of God's power and to use creation as a way to give us an appreciation for God's immensity. Like, like I said earlier, holding, holding the oceans in the hollow of his hand and, and, and stretching out. We looked at this last week when, when it comes to the universe. It's like God popped a tent up, right? That's not to say it's not majestic and marvelous. It just wasn't hard. It wasn't any effort for God. God did not exhaust himself in doing this. He's created the ends of the earth, and that's exactly then what he's getting at when he follows that by saying, he neither faints nor is weary. I love the way Hebrew poetry does this, giving us two words that for, for, for in most cases are synonyms, though not exactly. Giving us two words that really do overlap one another in terms of meaning, but yet then provide a, a fuller understanding of things. So to, to say God does not faint and also God does not grow weary, it's to kind of describe two kinds of circumstances. In other words, and this, is, this is kind of how I put it in the first service, God's sugars never get low, all right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Some of you think, yeah, mine is right now. Right. So feel free. Have a chocolate if you got it. All right? In other words, you know, that, that, that fainting sense, like where all of a sudden you just, you get, you get zapped of, of energy and, uh, and a pint of ice cream takes care of it. All right? So it's just, it's those moments where you think, you know, where you have, you're, you're having a spell. All right? Where, where you just feel like, I just don't have anything in me. All of a sudden, God does not, God does not faint, nor does God grow weary. And that's describing the long haul. That, that, that means, you know, that God runs a mile the same the first mile as he does the 26th, all right? If you're running a marathon, in other words, God never wearies. God, God never invests less energy. God never has less power. It, you know, it's, it's not like God has gotten to this point in human history, sitting up in heaven thinking, you know what? This whole God thing is a young man's game. <laughs> I don't know, I got it left in me anymore. This is not the language he uses about himself. He neither faints. He doesn't have moments where all of a sudden he just doesn't have power to do things, nor does he grow weary over the long haul. So I want to encourage you here, church. It, it, it may be only a partial encouragement because it doesn't mean all of your pain and problems and trials and tribulations, whatever the thing is that's burdening you, whatever the circumstances, wh whether it's the larger, you know, national community ones related to, to physical health or to politics or whatever your, your own kind of struggle and turmoil is, I know you're getting weary of it, but God's not. It's not wearing him down. He's, he's not throwing up his hands and saying, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Now, I, I, I've reached my limit. This is the best I've got. He neither faints nor grows weary. And then it says his understanding is unsearchable. It's an interesting way then to follow that up. In, in other words, he, he has perfect and complete knowledge, and in fact, it, it, we can't fathom it. 
Not, not only does he have this absolute power and strength, he's always God to the equal degree he's always been God and always will be that kind of God, neither fainting nor growing weary, nor, get, nor getting tired. And at the same time, his knowledge is perfect and, and it even goes beyond your own. God has a knowledge of your life not even accessible to you. God has a knowledge of your pain and problems you don't even realize. <laughs> He knows stuff about your stuff that you don't even know about your own stuff. It's unsearchable. By the way, you know, this also means something important as, as it applies to God and His nature. To describe His knowledge, His understanding is unsearchable. This means you don't get to psychoanalyze God. God's not interested in your opinion of Him. Meaning meaning your critique of how he decides to run his world, all right? You, you have no platform from which you can speak with any kind of meaningful intelligence that would bring into question what God does, how God does it, when God does it. This is who he is. But it's interesting, though. All of this, though, leads up to the next statement, verse 29. This God, everlasting God, created things together, doesn't faint, doesn't grow weary, understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, He increases strength. There's nothing tricky behind those words. This is what God does. This is God's ministry to those who are weak, to those, to, to those who are without might, to those who recognize they can't, God does provide sufficient resources to accomplish the task He's designed for them to accomplish. In other words, He's telling the folks who are in exile, those of you who think God's, God's hidden from you or your way has been hidden from God, that's not the case. And in fact, God is actively engaged in your circumstances to bring you to the end of it, to bring you through it, whatever that may be. God's doing that. God supplies. God provides. God is able to meet all of these needs. And I love that language. He gives power to the weak. To those who have no might, He increases strength. I, I, I think this not only states just a plain fact, I, I think it also encourages a certain posture on our part. In other words, this doesn't mean God supplies strength to you only when you are in your weakest moments. I would argue this is suggesting you should understand your position as perpetually in a place of weakness and requiring God supplying strength. To those who recognize their circumstances, to those who are weak, to those who humble themselves before God, those who in arrogance and presumptuousness assume they can manage the affairs of their own life, it's going to be a long road. But to those in humility recognize their weakness, God does supply. All right, let's go on to one more, final one. And that is His willingness. Not only does, is, does God have knowledge of your circumstances, not only is God then able to intervene to provide for your circumstances. He's willing. He demonstrates a willingness to do so. He, he is, in fact, engaged in these things. Notice how he goes on in verse 30. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. So this verse is an interesting one. It's kind of a follow-up to verse 29, but prepping us for verse 31. So, so he, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. Verse 30 then furthers the explanation of who those folks are. And to say that, he, that, 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 that even youths will faint and be weary and young men utter, utterly fall. Again, it's, it's, it's a way that Hebrew poetry gives us kind of the, the highest thing a thing can be to describe how all of us need the thing it's talking about. In other words, if even youth grow weary... And the reference there, by the way, to young men, that could be a reference. He could be speaking with a technical word 
to talk about those who are serving in the military, right? So, so ideally, what do we think of of those in the military, those who are, would be at peak condition, right? Those who are able and to fight and they're trained and equipped and skilled. And so that's the image that he's using here. Those who are, who are of the, the highest level of strength and endurance, even they get weak. I don't got military folks in here. We've got those who are in the military. We have those who were in the military. Was there ever a time in your training that you felt weak? Probably. In fact, you may not want to describe all of the things that happened to your body when you got pushed by whoever was in charge of you to the greatest degree they could push you, right? How about your kids? I know what you think. Well, here's what, what do we usually think about kids? They seem to have an unending supply of energy. Don't we say that kind of thing? They seem to have bounding energy until you take them to Target, right? Then they can't seem to move a muscle, right? Now they're dragging on the back of the cart. Now they want you to hold them. Now they're whining. I say that because I was that kid, except it wasn't Target, it was the commissary, all right? I was that kid. Yeah, I had boundless energy until I didn't want to be where I was, and all of a sudden, oh, I can't move my leg, right? Till my dad was taking us. My father took us to Washington, D.C. in one day. All right? That's the colonel in the Air Force. One day. We did the whole thing. I saw all of it. All right? I saw all of it physically. All right? Mentally and emotionally. I don't know what I saw. But we, and you want to, uh, yeah, so tired. Yeah, tired. Even, even these that seem to have an endless supply. So he's using this as language that says, look, even, the, even those who seem to be at the peak of performance, they don't have sufficient resources to do this. This is what he's getting at. You cannot do this thing. But that's okay, because verse 31, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Don't you love how he picks up on the same language he used about God to talk to us? Is that not a beautiful expression of God's grace? You don't have sufficient resources. So what does God provide? He provides His own. <laughs> How does God do that? By providing Himself. It's a profound statement. Yeah, and I wouldn't read too much into that. I don't think this is describing three ways you can live life. You can live life soaring with the eagles or live life running, you know, or live life... I don't think... I've heard sermons like that. I don't think that's what this is doing, all right? I think it's just a way of describing, at times, the strength you receive does enable you to feel like you are at the peak of your performance. At other times, yeah, I can run pretty good. At other times, nope, I'm just putting one foot in front of the other. But either way, what are all of them doing? Moving. Progressing. Advancing. I mean, that, that's the common denominator around all of those. But wh how do we get that, though? What, what needs to be done? Those who wait on the Lord. Now, we don't want to be distracted by this term. The, the Hebrew word here is tricky to translate because it really encompasses two or three English words. That's why, like, if you have an NIV, it uses the word hope. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Because the word here does describe all of that. It describes hoping in. It describes like, the, the language is like a patient trust and confidence in God that is certain God will do what God has promised to do. Therefore, I'm going to continue to walk in faith and obedience to Him as God supplies all of my needs. I don't, that's, that's a long definition. Say, Pastor, can you repeat that? Probably not. So you'll just have to listen to this again, all right? But, uh, but I think that that is what the word is getting at. In other words, to wait on God, that doesn't mean like some passive, you know, well, great. Uh, I'm going to sit on the couch and I'm going to watch football until I get Holy Spirit goosebumps and a good zap from God and get electrified, you know, as if, as if you know, I'm Popeye and I've opened a can of spinach, right? And it's, I've drained it and now I've got at least one arm that's really strong and then, and now I can go do whatever, you know, beat up whatever bad guy I need to beat up. So that, that's kind of the image people have, this waiting, like, okay, well, I'll just 
Just sit back, relax. And it sounds really spiritual, by the way. When you say, well, I'm just, I'm just waiting on God. All right, so, so I would caution you to make sure you, you clarify that because we don't want that to sound like we are being passive. God's not just saying, well, until I do something for you, I, you know what, you're just going to have to hang out. Just, you know, this, it's a divine version of a pandemic shutdown, all right? I'm just going to shut you down for a few weeks, all right? You just hang out here, all right? Uh, you know, cruise online, do whatever, you know, you know, binge watch, whatever. All right, just hang out till I tell you. That's not what this means. It is describing those who in confidence, trust, God has made a promise. And so now I'm going to live my life in the promise of God as if the promise has already been fulfilled. I'm going to continue to live in obedience and faith. In fact, I've got another slide for you. I know where we are. I know what time it is, all right? Because there's a big clock up there, all right? It's not big, but it's up there. I can see it. Because now you're thinking, oh man, he's just put five more points up there. Uh, Wow, we're going to be waiting on him to finish this thing. And I don't have any trust or confidence he can do it. All right, so you can take a picture of it. You can email me and I will pass this along. I just give this to you as kind of almost a simple concluding set of points here to give us an idea. What does it mean to wait on God, to have confident trust and hope? In other words, there are certain things God has said to do, and we should always be doing them. We should always be doing them. Yeah, maybe there are specific ways in which you want God to relieve you of your burden. Is anybody here ready to be relieved of the burden of COVID-19? Is that going to happen tomorrow? Could God cause it to happen tomorrow? Well, sure. But it appears that he's not. Does that mean I can't make it? Does that mean we're hidden from God's view? Does that mean he's passed over our just cause? Now, what what do I do in the meantime? I, I trust Trust in God's promises. I don't know what that will look like. I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't, I'm not necessarily saying 2021 will be easier than 2020. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have any idea. But I do know there's things I'm to do, and I'm to trust in God's promises. I'm to meditate on God's Word. There's never a time when I should not be doing this, right? God's Word should be a, should be a consistent part of my diet. And I will tell you, the, the, the ability you have to wait patiently and trust in God's promises is directly tied to the amount of time you spend meditating on God's Word. These things will be connected. If you just want to live your life in fear and anxiety and uncertainty and this constant uh, sense of concern about what's coming next, just don't, don't read the Bible, all right? That, that'll take care of it. We know we're to meditate on this. We're also to lean on God's people. God did not design us to live our Christian life by ourselves. Because sometimes I walk through dark days and you're not. Guess what I need? I need you. That's what I need. Sometimes my days aren't as dark, but yours turn cloudy and tempest-like. Guess what you need? You need me. We need one another to lean on. That's always the case. That's what we're doing. We're leaning on one another. We obey God's commands. That's another thing we should always be doing. What are we doing when we're waiting on the Lord? We, how, how are we demonstrating this willingness to hope in God's promises as He provides for us? We obey Him. And then, you know, the first four points, they all have like this nice symmetry to them, uh, but I couldn't figure that out for the fifth one, and so I just said pray, all right? Uh, and some of you are thinking, I wish you were that to the point all the time. All right, but, but obviously that's another one, right? Just Pray. Prayer, should, prayer is, is an important central feature to doing this well. We can be comforted. We can be comforted by the fact that God has promised to provide. 2020 was difficult. 2020 has con- continued a sense of uncertainty. I know, I know that's true, again, whether it's related to, to the virus, whether it's related to, to politics and social and cultural issues, we're burdened by these things. But don't forget, church, we are exiles here. 
We are pilgrims and strangers. We ultimately do not belong here. So if you feel out of sorts with the world around you, say, thank you, God. Because we should feel that way. And what do we do then? While we patiently trust in God's promises to be fulfilled, living as if they've already been fulfilled, we do these things. We live as God's Word has called on us to live, and we trust in His gracious provision to, toward us. He may not give us what we want and how we want it, when we want it, but He'll give us what we need, when we need it, and how we need it. We rest in that. Knowing that all of this then is given to us because of what God's done for us in Christ. We do need to make this explicit, by the way. This is ours, not because we've done something to deserve it, but because God has made us right with Him in Christ. These, these are the promises that come with His saving and redeeming work. The fact that we have confessed our sin and confessed our confidence in Christ crucified and resurrected. Then we have accessible to us all of these great and precious promises of God. It is because of the gospel and the gospel itself. It is because we have Christ and Christ Himself. It's because of His goodness toward us that we can have confidence in these things. And so I'd make an appeal, believer, that you would walk in the fullness of the gospel and the truth of God to you in Christ. To those who are not believers, I would implore you, trust on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess that you are a sinner. Confess Christ died for you and rose from the dead. Ask God to save you based on what Christ and Christ alone has done for you. That you seek Him out and His saving and atoning work because all that we've talked about is only for those who are the people of God. Have you trusted in the gospel? And dear believer, are you still walking in a trust in that gospel? Let's stand together. I'm going to pray. After I pray, we'll then sing another great song of confidence in this glorious gospel and who we are because of what Christ has done for us. So let's pray. Father God, we do thank you again for the gathering of your people. We thank you, God, for this word. We thank you, God, for your provision. Now, God, we ask that we would walk in it and that by faith we would patiently trust in how you are working in our lives and on our behalf, providing us with what we need when we need it. May we then continue to live by faith and obedience to you and to the glory of your great name. God, may you bring your word to bear on our lives that we might continue to walk by faith and walk in a way that's worthy of the calling with which we have been called. That's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Grace to live through endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to side. When he comes at Amen. Is that not encouraging words, church, that He's the one who holds us fast? He's the one that even in the midst of our greatest weakness ensures that we endure to the end. What a good word uh, to sing uh, this morning. Well, again, thank you for being a part of this time. It's been a blessing to worship with God's people. As I mentioned, I'll be down front. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, if you're visiting with us, would love to be able to do that. Would also remind you, we'll have deacons at, uh, at the doors. If you came prepared to give, they'll have offering plates. You can just drop that uh, gift in the offering plate. And we do thank you for anything you'd give uh, to the work of His church. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock. We have Bible study in here for uh, adults. And uh, it's continuing our discussion of David and Goliath, what the story is really about. Uh, we have Juana. We have uh, the youth and parents study. So there's something for everyone, so come back, be a part uh, of our time tonight. Also, Wednesday night, kicked off some new uh, activities. We have children's choir that begins at 5.30, and then 6.15 is their Generations of Grace Discipleship Program. 7.10, following prayer meeting, is a, is a sanctuary choir, so you got, a, got an opportunity to get involved with that. So a lot of ways that you can be involved in the work that's uh, happening here at Tabernacle. I'll invite you to do so. We're going to leave hearing from God's words. Pastor Aaron Allen is going to come with our benediction. Well, as we conclude our service this morning, what better way than to be comforted once more by this great promise from God. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So, brothers and sisters, since our hope of salvation is assured through our Lord Jesus Christ, may the peace of God reign in your hearts and your minds through the trials of the days to come. Amen.